Sanctuary by Nella Larson. On the southern coast between Merton, Merton and Shawborough, there is a strip of desolation, some half a mile wide and nearly 10 miles long between the sea and old fields of ruined plantations. Skirting the edge of this narrow jungle is a partly grown over road, which still shows traces of furrows made by the wheels of wagons that have long since rotted away or been cut into firewood. This road is little used now that the state has built its new highway a bit to the west and wagons are less numerous than automobiles. In the forsaken road, a man was walking swiftly, but in spite of his hurry, at every step he set down his feet with infinite care, for the night was windless and the heavy silence intensified each sound. Even the breaking of a twig could be plainly heard, and the man had need of caution as well as haste. Before a lonely cottage that shrank timidly from the road, the man hesitated a moment, then struck out across the patch of green in front of it. Stepping behind a clump of bushes close to the house, he looked in through the lighted window at Amy Poole, standing at her table, mixing the supper biscuits. He was a big black man with pale brown eyes in which there was an odd mixture of fear and amazement. The light showed streaks of gray soil on his heavy sweating face and the great hands and his torn and on his torn clothes. In his woolly hair clung bits of dried leaves and dead grass. He made a gesture as if to tap on the window, but turned away to the door instead. Without knocking, he just opened it and went in. Chapter two, the woman's brown gaze was immediately on him, though she did not move. She said, you ain't no hurry as you Jim Hammer. It wasn't, however, entirely a question. Ah's in trouble, Miss Poole, the man explained, his voice shaking, his fingers twitching. What you done now? Shot a man, Miss Poole. Truth. The woman seemed calm, but the word was spat out. Yes, shot him. In the man's tone was something of wonder as if he himself could not quite believe that he had really done this thing, which he had affirmed. Dave? Don't know, Miss Poole, don't know. White man, oh, can't say, Miss Poole. White man, I reckons. Annie Poole looked at him with cold contempt. She was a tiny withered woman, 50 perhaps, with a wrinkled face, the color of old copper framed by a crinkly mass of white hair. But about her small figure was some quality of hardness that belied her appearance of frailty. At last, she spoke, boring her sharp little eyes into those of the anxious creature before her. And what am you looking for for me? Do about it. Just let me stop till they's gone by. Hide me till they passes. Reckon they, they ain't fur off now. His begging voice changed to a frightened whimper. For, for the Lord's sake, Miss Pope, uh, uh, let me stop. And why? The woman inquired caustically. Should she run the dangerous risk of, of hiding him? Uh, Obadiah, he'd let me stop if he was home. The man whined. Annie Poole sighed. Yes, she admitted slowly, reluctantly. And I spec he would. Obadiah's too good to you all, no count trash. Her slight shoulders lifted in a hopeless shrug. Yes, I reckon he'd do it. I'm especially seeing how he allus set such a heap of store by you. Can't see what for. Myself, I sure don't see nothing in you but a heap of dirt. But a look of irony, of cunning, of complicity passed over her face, and she went on. Still, considering all in all how Obadiah is right fond of you and how white folks is white folks, I'm going to hide you this one time. Crossing the kitchen, she opened an, a door leading into a small bedroom, saying, Get yourself in that, in that there Beth feather bed, and I'm going to put clo the clothes on top. Don't reckon they'll find you if they look for you in my house, and I don't expect they'll go for 
afford to do that. Not less than you've been careless and let him smell you out getting here. She turned on him a withering look. You always been trifling. Can't do nothing proper. And I'm a telling you, if they won't white folks and you won't a pole, and sure wouldn't be, I sure wouldn't be letting you mess up my feather bed this evening because I just plain don't want you here and done kept myself out in trouble all my life. So's Obadiah. I was powerful obliged to you, Miss Poole, and you sure am one good woman. I, the Lord most, mo most certainly, and he pulled, cut him off. This ain't no time for all that kind of fiddle roll. I does my duty and sees it without no folks from you. If the Lord had given you a white face instead of that there black one, and sure would, I sure would turn you out. And now you hush your mouth and get yourself in. And don't get moving and scrunching under those covers and get yourself cotched in my house. Without further comment, the man did as he was told. And after he laid his soiled body and grimy garments between her snowy sheets, Annie Poole carefully rearranged the covering and places piles of freshly laundered linen on top. Then she gave a pat here and there, eyed the result and finding it satisfactory, went back to her cooking. Chapter three, Jim Hammer settled down to the racking business of waiting until the approaching danger should have passed him by. Soon savory odors seeped into him and he realized that he was hungry. He wished that any pool would bring him something to eat, just one biscuit, but she wouldn't, he knew. Not she, she was a hard one, Obadiah's mother. By and by, he fell into sleep from which he was dragged back by the rumbling sound of wheels in the road outside. For a second, he feared, fear clutched at him so tightly that he almost leaped from the suffocating shelter of the bed in order to make some active attempt to escape the horror that his capture meant. There was a spasm at his heart, a pain so sharp, so slashing, that he had to suppress an impulse to cry out. And he felt himself falling down, 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 Everything grew dim and very distant in his memory, vanished. Came running back. Outside, there was silence. He strained his ears. Nothing. No footsteps, no voices. They had gone on then. Gone without even stopping to ask any pool if she had seen him pass by. A sigh of relief slipped from him. His thick lips curled in an ugly, cunning smile. It had been smart of him to think of coming to Obadiah's mother to hide. She was an old demon, but he was safe in her house. He lay a short while longer, listening intently and hearing nothing. He started to get up, but immediately he stopped, his yellow eyes glowing like pale flames. He had heard the unmistakable sound of men coming toward the house. Swiftly, he slid back into the heavy, hot stuffiness of the bed and lay listening fearfully. The terrifying sounds drew nearer, slowly, heavily. Just for a moment, he thought they were not coming in. They took so long that there was a light knock and the noise of the door being opened. His whole body went taut. His feet felt frozen, his hands clammy, his tongue like a weighted, dying thing. His pounding heart made it hard for his straining ears to hear what they were saying out there. Evening, Mr. Mister Lowndes. Annie's pool sounded as it always did, sharp and dry. There was no answer. Or had he missed it? With slow care, he shifted his position, bringing his head nearer the edge of the bed. Still, he heard nothing. What were they waiting for? Why didn't they ask about him? Andy Poole, it seemed, was of the same mind. I don't reckon y'all done traipsed out here just for your health, she hinted. There's bad news for you, Annie. I'm afraid. The sheriff's voice was low and queer. Jim Hammer visualized him standing out there, a tall, stooped man with his white tobacco-stained mustache drooping limply at the ends, his nose hooked and sharp, his eyes blue and cold. Bill Lowndes was a hard one, too, and white. What all bad news, Mr. Lowndes? The woman put the question quietly, directly. Obadiah, the sheriff began. 
hesitated, began to die again. Obadiah, uh, um, he's outside, Annie. I, I'm afraid. Shucks, you done missed Obadiah. He ain't done nothing. Mr. Mr. Lowndes, Obadiah, she said, she called stridently. Obadiah, get in here and explain yourself. But Obadiah didn't answer. He didn't come in. Other men came in. Came in with steps that dragged and halted and no one spoke. Not even Annie Poole. Something was laid carefully on the floor. Obadiah, chow, his mother said softly. Obadiah, chow, then with sudden alarm. He ain't dead, is he, Mr. Lowndes? Obadiah, he ain't dead. Mr. Jim Hammer didn't catch the answer to that pleading question. A new fear was stealing over him. There was a to-do, Annie, Bill Lowndes explained gently, at the garage. At the garage, back of the factory, a fellow trying to steal tires. Obadiah heard a noise and run out with two or three others. Scared the rascal all right, fired off his gun and run. We allow it to be Jim Hammer. Picked up his cap back there. There was no count, thieving and sly, but we'll get him, Annie, we'll get him. The man huddled in the feather bed, prayed silently. Oh, Lord, I didn't go to, go to do that, but not, not, not Obadiah, Lord. You, you knows that, you knows it. And in his frenzied brain came the thought that it would be better for him to get up and go out to them before any pool gave him away, for he was lost now. With all his great strength, he tried to get himself out of the bed, but he couldn't. Oh, Lord, he moaned. He moaned. Oh, Lord. And his thoughts were bitter, and they ran through his mind like panic. He knew that it had come to pass. As it said somewhere in the Bible about the wicked, the Lord had stretched out his hand and smitten him. He was paralyzed. He couldn't move hand or foot, and he moaned again. It was all there was left for him to do, for in terror, in the terror of his calamity that had come upon him, he had forgotten the waiting danger, which was so near, out in the kitchen. His hunters, however, didn't hear him. And Bill Lowndes was just saying, we've been, we've been a-looking for Jim out along the old road. Figured he'd make tracks for Shawboro. You ain't noticed anybody pass this evening, Annie. The reply came promptly, unwaveringly. No, I ain't seen nobody pass. Not yet. Chapter 4. Jim Hammer caught his breath. Well, the sheriff concluded, we'll be getting along. Obadiah was a mighty fine boy. If they was all like him, I'm sorry, Annie. Anything I can do, you, you let me know. Thank you, Mr. Lowndes. With the sound of the door closing on the departing men, power to move came back to the man in the bedroom, and he pushed his dirt cake feet out from the covers and rose up and crouched down again. He wasn't cold now but hot all over and burning. Almost he wished that Bill Lowndes and his men had taken him with him. Annie Poole came into the room. It seemed a long time before Obadiah's mother spoke, and when she did, there were no tears, no reproaches, but there was a raging fury in her voice as she lashed out, Get out of my feather bed, Jim Hammer, and out in my house, and don't never stop thanking your Jesus. He done give you that black face.